preface by Alex Comfort. I am a physician and human biologist for whom the natural history of human sexuality is of as much interest as the rest of human natural history. As with the rest of human natural history, I had notes on it. My wife encouraged me to bring biology into medicine, and my old medical school had no decent textbook to teach a human sexuality course. Joy was compiled and, very importantly, illustrated, just after the end of that daft and extraordinary non-statute in Western society, the Sexual Official Secrets Act. For at least 200 years, the description, and above all the depiction, of this most familiar and domestic group of activities, and of almost everything associated with them, had been classified. When, in the 16th century, Giulio Romano engraved his weightily classical pictures showing 16 ways of making love, and Airy Eno wrote poems to go with them, a leading ecclesiastic opined that the artist deserved to be crucified. The public, apparently, thought otherwise. Why, said Airy Eno, should we not look upon that which pleases us most? And Arian's postures have circulated surreptitiously ever since. But even in 1950s Britain pubic hair had to be airbrushed out to provide a smooth and featureless surface. People today, who never experienced the freeze on sexual information, won't appreciate the propositions of the transformation when it ended. It was like ripping down the Iron Curtain. My immediate predecessor in writing about domestic sex, Dr. Eustace Chaser, was, unsuccessfully, prosecuted for his low-key, unillustrated book Love Without Fear, and even in 1972 there was still some remaining doubt about whether Joy would be banned by the thought police. The main aim of sexual bibliotherapy, writing books like this one, was to undo some of the mischief caused by the guilt, misinformation, and lack of information. That kind of reassurance is still needed. I have asked various people, chiefly older couples, whether the joy of sex told them things they didn't know, or reassured them about things they knew and already did or would like to do. I have had both answers. One can now read books and see pictures devoted to sexual behavior almost without limitation in democratic countries, but it takes more than a few decades and a turnover of generations to undo centuries of misinformation. And of this material, much is anxious or hostile or over the top. People who worried, when the book first came out, if they did some of the things, described in it may now worry if they don't do all of them, that we can't help, nor the fact that the same people who went to doctors because of sexual fear and inhibition under the old dispensation now go complaining of sexual indigestion under the new, sexual behavior probably changes remarkably little over the years, sexual revolutions and moral backlashes chiefly affect the degree of frankness or reticence about what people do in private. The main contributor to any sexual revolution in our own time, insofar as it affects behavior, has not been frankness but the advent of reliable contraception, which makes it possible to separate the reproductive and recreational uses of sexuality. Where unanxious books dealing as accurately as possible with the range of sexual behaviors are most valuable is in encouraging the sexually active reader, who both wants to enjoy sex and to be responsible about it and in aiding the helping professions to avoid causing problems to their clients. It is only recently, as ethology has replaced psychoanalytic theory, that counselors have come to realize that sex, besides being a serious interpersonal matter, is a deeply rewarding form of play. Children are not encouraged to be embarrassed about their play. Adults often have been and are still. So long as play is not hostile, cruel, unhappy, or limiting, they need not be. One of the most important uses of play is in expressing a healthy awareness of sexual equality. This involves letting both sexes take turns in controlling the game. Sex is no longer what men do to women and women are supposed to enjoy. Sexual interaction is sometimes a loving fusion, sometimes a situation where each is a sex object. Maturity in sexual relationships involves balancing, rather than denying the personal and impersonal aspects of arousal. Both are essential and built into humans. For anyone who is short on either of these elements, play is the way to learn. Men learn to stop domineering and trying to perform. Women discover that they can take control in the give and take of the game rather than by naysaying. If they achieve this, 
Man and woman are one another's best friends in the very sparks they strike from one another. This book has changed considerably since its first edition and it will be revised again in the future as knowledge increases. What will not change is the central importance of unanxious, responsible, and happy sexuality in the lives of normal people. For what they need, in a culture that does not learn skills and comparisons in this area of living by watching, is accurate and unbothered information. The availability of this, and public resistance to the minority of disturbed people who for so long limited it, is an excellent test of the degree of liberty and concern in a society, reflected in the now old injunction to make love, not war. It is a socially relevant test today. Alex Comfort, M.B. D.SC, 1991, prefaced by Susan Quilliam. I am a relationships psychologist and sexologist whose lifetime aim, through a variety of expert roles, has been to help people enhance their emotional and sexual partnerships. So when the publishers of The Joy of Sex approached me to reinvent the book for the 21st century, it seemed to me the fulfillment of everything I have been working for. I well remember the original publication of Joy and the awed giggles with which I and my friends read, discussed, and then put into practice its suggestions, so I know firsthand what over the decades proved to be true. Joy is an astonishing and inspirational child of its age, born not only out of social but also political changes that irreversibly altered the sexual landscape for individuals, couples, and society. Barely a decade before the book's 1972 publication, the contraceptive pill had, for the first time in history, enabled women to have control over their own fertility. In its wake came increased female education, emancipation, and self-belief, as well as a whole host of liberalizations, sexual and social, increasing permissiveness, more frequent cohabitation, easier divorce, more available erotica, and gay rights. Joy was not only a product of this revolution, it also helped create it. Dr. Alex Comfort's aim was to write the first book that gave readers accurate knowledge about sexuality, and permission to use that knowledge. The text and illustrations were designed to both reassure reader that their sexuality was normal and to offer further possibilities with which to expand their sexual menu. He was hugely effective in his intention. 8.5 million copies of The Joy of Sex have been sold to date and it has been translated into 14 languages. More than that, it was a key influence on the social changes of the late 20th century and has been a byword for sexual vision ever since. Why, then, reinvent? There have already been content revisions, in the author's lifetime and after his death in 2000, the most recent being the highly successful 30th anniversary edition by Alex's son Nicholas Comfort. But the very changes that Joy itself wrought in society have meant that the book has come to need updating in a more fundamental way. This was my task, to recreate the joy of sex for the contemporary world, to do what Alex Comfort would have done had he been writing today. The majority of the text remains the same, but substantial additions have been made. Many of these are informational. There have been countless key scientific discoveries in recent years in the fields of physiology, psychology, psychotherapy, and medicine, while the advent of sexology, the specialist study of sexual matters, has resulted in both rigorous academic research and a more widespread public awareness of, and skill in, sex. Alongside these informational updates, a great deal of refocusing has been necessary to reflect social shifts. An intimate relationship is a very different animal from what it was in 1972. It's now largely expected that sex will be part of every love partnership, that bedroom activity will include practices previously considered outrageous, and that these practices will be informed and often suggested via a new raft of technological advances. It's acknowledged that a woman can lead just as much as a man, both in bed and out of it. One reason why the publisher chose a woman to reinvent the book, and it is, albeit slowly, now acknowledged that a couple's sex life lasts well into their later years and increases, rather than decreases, in quality. Yet along with all these positive developments has come a flurry of problems that weren't predicted in the heady days of 1972. Pressure to have sex. Regret that one has had sex. Worry that one isn't sufficiently beautiful to deserve sex. 
worry that one isn't having enough sex or enough good sex, and all that is set beside high rates of pregnancy, abortion, and sexually transmitted infections, in the 21st century, as we hastily adapt to a society arguably more sexualized than any previous one, it's a wild world out there, all of which is why the many changes made to joy have been underpinned by what remains the same, an absolute yet pragmatic optimism around sexuality and its place in our lives. Running throughout the original book was a rock-solid seam of positivity that sex is a good thing and that mature adults, given the right information and inspiration, can be trusted to treat it as such. Despite the headlines and scare stories, I still deeply believe in what Alex Comfort proposed, that sex should be and can be a total joy. I have loved reinventing the book because Alex Comfort's values and aims are also mine. I too want to present knowledge in an accessible form, to encourage mature decision making and offer the skills and strategies to do it. To protest attempts to enforce inhibitions on human sexuality, to see sex as the ultimate in a human play, but at the same time a developmental essential that helps us grow as people and partners, above all, to give people not just the technicalities, the fripperies, or the junk food of sexual literature, but an intelligent, thoughtful, and may treatment of the topic. In the end I return to, and repeat in my own voice, Alex Comfort's words from his first preface, my intention and my hope is that this book will benefit the ordinary, sexually active reader, eager to both enjoy sexuality and to be tender, and responsible with it. True in 1972, just as true today, Susan Quilliam, 2008. I like my body when it is with your body. It is so quite new a thing, muscles better and nerves more. I like your body. I like what it does. I like its house. I like to feel the spine of your body and its bones, and the trembling, firm smoothness and which I will, again and again and again, kiss. I like kissing this and that of you. I like slowly stroking there, shocking fuzz, of your electric fur, and what is it comes, over parting flesh, and eyes big love crumbs, and possibly I like the thrill, of under me you so quite new, for Cambria, whence it all began, copyright copyright octopus publishing group limited 2008, all rights reserved, published in the United States by Crown Publishers, an imprint of the Crown Publishing Group, a division of Random House, Incorporated, New York, www.crownpublishing.com, Crown and the Crown Colophon are registered trademarks of Random House, Incorporated, originally published in Great Britain by Modsit Securities Limited, London, in 1972, updated and re-illustrated editions were published in 1991, 1996, 2002, and 2008 by Mitchell Beasley an imprint of Octopus Publishing Group Limited, London. This current edition was published in Great Britain as the New Joy of Sex, Library of Congress Cataloging in Publication Data, Comfort, Alex, 1920-2000, The Joy of Sex, Alex Comfort, Susan Quilliam, Reverend, Ed, originally published, New York, Crown, 1972, First American Ed, of, revision originally published in Great Britain in 2008 by Mitchell Beasley, includes bibliographical references and index, 1, sex instruction, 2, sex customs, I, Quilliam, Susan, 2, title, HQ 31.C 743 2008, 613.9 apostrophe 60C 22 2008017531, ISM, 978-030745239, Commissioning Editor Hannah Barnes Murphy, Senior Editor Leanne Bryan, Copy Editor Joe Richardson, Proofreader Salama Harani, Art Director Tim Foster, Senior Art Editor Juliet Norsworthy, Illustrator Russell Faulkner, Production Manager Peter Hunt, V3.1, Contents, Cover, Copyright, Title Page, Preface by Alex Comfort, Preface by Susan Quilliam, On My Lovemaking, Ingredients, Tenderness, Nakedness, Women, By Her For Him, Men, By Him For Her, Hormones, Preferences, Confidence, 
cassolette, vulva, vagina, clitoris, mons parbis, breasts, nipples, buttocks, penis, size, foreskin, scrotum, semen, skin, lubrication, earlobes, navel, armpit, feet, big toe, hair, pubic hair, health, age, sex maps, fidelity, compatibility, desire, love, appetizers, real sex, food, dancing, femoral intercourse, clothed intercourse, safe sex, phone sex, words, technology, frequency, priorities, seduction, bathing, beds, kisses, pat star a knee, friction rub, feathers, aphrodisiacs, fantasy, breathing, tongue bath, blowing, bites, lonanism, fighting, main courses, postures, hand work for her, hand work for him, mouth work for her, mouth work for him, clitoral pleasure, soix and enough, birth control, his erection, performance, penetration, choreography, trigger points, missionary position, matrimonial, variety, upper hands, frontal, inversion, exposition, flanquet, standing positions, rear entry, postillionage, anal intercourse, croup aid, QS aid, kneeling positions, seated positions, turning positions, Viennese oyster, sex and pregnancy, plateau phase, his orgasm, hair trigger trouble, saxonus, pompa, her orgasm, bridge, cat, venus butterfly, bird song at morning, little death, come again, excesses, simultaneous orgasm, quickies, holding back, relaxation, afterwards, waking, sauces and pickles, playtime, Japanese style, horse, Indian style, virginity, clothes, corset, g-string, shoes, boots, stockings, Benoit balls, boutons, rubber, leather, striptease, transvestitism, ice and fire, body paints, skin gloves and thimbles, ticklers, games, masks, fetishes, equipment, rocking chair, swings, jokes and follies, mirrors, trains, boats, planes, cars, open air, remote control, voyeurs, erotica, sex shops, leanx, inflators, penis extensions, kerstsa, ligotage, blindfold, chains, harness, gags, rope work, hazards, merkins, dildos, vibrators, pain, discipline, foursomes and more essomes, slow masturbation for him, slow masturbation for her, joy, resources, support, index, acknowledgements, preface by Alex Comfort, I am a physician and human biologist for whom the natural history of human sexuality is of as much interest as the rest of human natural history, as with the rest of human natural history, I had notes on it, my wife encouraged me to bring biology into medicine, and my old medical school had no decent textbook to teach a human sexuality course, joy was compiled and, very importantly, illustrated, just after the end of that daft and extraordinary non-statute in Western society, the Sexual Official Secrets Act, for at least 200 years, the description, and above all the depiction, of this most familiar and domestic group of activities, and of almost everything associated with them, had been classified, when, in the 16th century, Giulio Romano engraved his weightily classical pictures showing sixteen ways of making love, and Airy Eno wrote poems to go with them, a leading ecclesiastic opined that the artist deserved to be crucified. The public, apparently, thought otherwise, why, said Airy Eno, should we not look upon that which pleases us most, and Arian's postures have circulated surreptitiously ever since. But even in 1950s Britain pubic hair had to be airbrushed out to provide a smooth and featureless surface. People today, who never experienced the freeze on sexual information, won't appreciate the propositions of the transformation when it ended. It was like ripping down the Iron Curtain. My immediate predecessor in writing about domestic sex, Dr. Eustace Chaser, was, unsuccessfully, prosecuted for his low-key, unillustrated book Love Without Fear and even in 1972 there was still some remaining doubt about whether Joy would be banned by the thought police. The main aim of sexual bibliotherapy, writing books like this one, was to undo some of the mischief caused by the guilt, misinformation, and lack of information. That kind of reassurance is still needed, I have asked various people.
chiefly older couples, whether the joy of sex told them things they didn't know, or reassured them about things they knew and already did or would like to do. I have had both answers. One can now read books and see pictures devoted to sexual behavior almost without limitation in democratic countries, but it takes more than a few decades and a turnover of generations to undo centuries of misinformation. And of this material, much is anxious or hostile or over the top. People who worried, when the book first came out, if they did some of the things described in it may now worry if they don't do all of them that we can't help, nor the fact that the same people who went to doctors because of sexual fear and inhibition under the old dispensation now go complaining of sexual indigestion under the new, sexual behavior probably changes remarkably little over the years, sexual revolutions and moral backlashes chiefly affect the degree of frankness or reticence about what people do in private. The main contributor to any sexual revolution in our own time insofar as it affects behavior, has not been frankness but the advent of reliable contraception, which makes it possible to separate the reproductive and recreational uses of sexuality, where unanxious books dealing as accurately as possible with the range of sexual behaviors are most valuable is in encouraging the sexually active reader, who both wants to enjoy sex and to be responsible about it, and in aiding the helping professions to avoid causing problems to their clients. It is only recently, as ethology has replaced psychoanalytic theory, that counselors have come to realize that sex, besides being a serious interpersonal matter, is a deeply rewarding form of play. Children are not encouraged to be embarrassed about their play. Adults often have been and are still, so long as play is not hostile, cruel, unhappy, or limiting they need not be. One of the most important uses of play is in expressing a healthy awareness of sexual equality. This involves letting both sexes take turns in controlling the game. Sex is no longer what men do to women and women are supposed to enjoy. Sexual interaction is sometimes a loving fusion, sometimes a situation where each is a sex object. Maturity in sexual relationships involves balancing, rather than denying the personal and impersonal aspects of arousal. Both are essential and built into humans. For anyone who is short on either of these elements, play is the way to learn. Men learn to stop domineering and trying to perform. Women discover that they can take control in the give and take of the game rather than by naysaying. If they achieve this, man and woman are one another's best friends in the very sparks they strike from one another. This book has changed considerably since its first edition and it will be revised again in the future. As knowledge increases, what will not change is the central importance of unanxious, responsible, and happy sexuality in the lives of normal people. For what they need, in a culture that does not learn skills and comparisons in this area of living by watching, is accurate and unbothered information. The availability of this, and public resistance to the minority of disturbed people who for so long limited it, is an excellent test of the degree of liberty and concern in a society, reflected in the now old injunction to make love, not war. It is a socially relevant test today. Alex Comfort, M.B. D.S.C. 1991 Preface by Susan Quilliam I am a relationships psychologist and sexologist whose lifetime aim, through a variety of expert roles, has been to help people enhance their emotional and sexual partnerships. So when the publishers of The Joy of Sex approached me to reinvent the book for the 21st century, it seemed to me the fulfillment of everything I have been working for. I well remember the original publication of Joy and the awed giggles with which I and my friends read, discussed, and then put into practice its suggestions. So I know firsthand what over the decades proved to be true. Joy is an astonishing and inspirational child of its age, born not only out of social but also political changes that irreversibly altered the sexual landscape for individuals, couples, and society. Barely a decade before the book's 1972, publication, the contraceptive pill had, for the first time in history, enabled women to have control over their own fertility. In its wake came increased female education, emancipation, and self-belief, as well as a whole host of liberalizations, sexual and social, increasing permissiveness, more frequent cohabitation, 
easier divorce, more available erotica, and gay rights. Joy was not only a product of this revolution, it also helped create it. Dr. Alex Comfort's aim was to write the first book that gave readers accurate knowledge about sexuality, and permission to use that knowledge. The text and illustrations were designed to both reassure readers that their sexuality was normal and to offer further possibilities with which to expand their sexual menu. He was hugely effective in his intention, 8.5 million copies of The Joy of Sex have been sold to date and it has been translated into 14 languages, more than that, it was a key influence on the social changes of the late 20th century and has been a byword for sexual vision ever since. Why, then, reinvent? There have already been content revisions, in the author's lifetime and after his death in 2000, the most recent being the highly successful 30th anniversary edition by Alex's son Nicholas Comfort, but the very changes that joy itself wrought in society have meant that the book has come to need updating in a more fundamental way. This was my task, to recreate the joy of sex for the contemporary world, to do what Alex Comfort would have done had he been writing today. The majority of the text remains the same, but substantial additions have been made. Many of these are informational. There have been countless key scientific discoveries in recent years in the fields of physiology, psychology, psychotherapy, and medicine, while the advent of sexology, the specialist study of sexual matters, has resulted in both rigorous academic research and a more widespread public awareness of, and skill in, sex. Alongside these informational updates, a great deal of refocusing has been necessary to reflect social shifts. An intimate relationship is a very different animal from what it was in 1972. It's now largely expected that sex will be part of every love partnership, that bedroom activity will include practices previously considered outrageous, and that these practices will be informed and often suggested via a new raft of technological advances. It's acknowledged that a woman can lead just as much as a man, both in bed and out of it. One reason why the publisher chose a woman to reinvent the book, and it is, albeit slowly, now acknowledged that a couple's sex life lasts well into their later years and increases, rather than decreases, in quality. Yet along with all these positive developments has come a flurry of problems that weren't predicted in the heady days of 1972. Pressure to have sex. Regret that one has had sex. Worry that one isn't sufficiently beautiful to deserve sex. Worry that one isn't having enough sex or enough good sex, and all that is set beside high rates of pregnancy, abortion, and sexually transmitted infections. In the 21st century, as we hastily adapt to a society arguably more sexualized than any previous one, it's a wild world out there, all of which is why the many changes made to joy have been underpinned by what remains the same. An absolute yet pragmatic optimism around sexuality and its place in our lives. Running throughout the original book was a rock-solid seam of positivity that sex is a good thing and that mature adults, given the right information and inspiration, can be trusted to treat it as such. Despite the headlines and scare stories, I still deeply believe in what Alex Comfort proposed, that sex should be and can be a total joy. I have loved reinventing the book because Alex Comfort's values and aims are also mine. I too want to present knowledge in an accessible form, to encourage mature decision making and offer the skills and strategies to do it, to protest attempts to enforce inhibitions on human sexuality, to see sex as the ultimate in human play, but at the same time a developmental essential that helps us grow as people and partners, above all, to give people not just the technicalities the fripperies, or the junk food of sexual literature, but an intelligent, thoughtful, and may treatment of the topic. In the end I return to, and repeat in my own voice, Alex Comfort's words from his first preface, my intention and my hope is that this book will benefit the ordinary, sexually active reader, eager to both enjoy sexuality and to be tender, and responsible with it. True in 1972, just as true today. Susan Quilliam, 2008. I like my body when it is with your body. It is so quite new a thing. Muscles better and nerves more. I like your body. I like what it does. I like its house. I like to feel the spine of your body and its bones. 
and the trembling, firm smoothness and which I will, again and again and again, kiss, I like kissing this and that of you, I like, slowly stroking there, shocking fuzz, of your electric fur, and what is it comes, over parting flesh, and eyes big love crumbs, and possibly I like the thrill, of under me you so quite new, e, e, Cummings. On my lovemaking, all of us, barring any physical limitations, are able to dance and sing, after a fashion, this, if you think about it, summarizes the justification for learning to make love, love, in the same way as singing, is something to be taken spontaneously, on the other hand, the difference between Pavlova and the Palais de Dance, or opera and barbershop singing, is much less than the difference between sexes our recent ancestors came to accept it and sex as it can be, at least we recognize this now, so that instead of worrying if sex is sinful, most people now worry whether they are getting satisfaction, one can worry about anything, given the determination, and there are now enough books about the basics, we are largely past the point of people worrying about the normality, possibility, and variety of sexual experience, this book is slightly different, in that there are now enough people who have those basics and want more depth of understanding, solid ideas, and inspiration, to draw a parallel, chef grade cooking doesn't happen naturally, it starts at the point where people know how to prepare and enjoy food, are curious about it and willing to take trouble preparing it, read recipe hints, and find they are helped by one or two techniques, it's hard to make mayonnaise by trial and error, for instance, may sex, as we define it, is the same, the extra one can get from comparing notes, using some imagination, trying way out or new experiences, when one already is making satisfying love and wants to go on from there, this book will likely attract four sorts of readers, first, there are those who don't fancy it, find it disturbing, and would rather stay the way they are, these should put it down, accept our apologies, and stay the way they are, second, there are those who are with the idea, but don't like our choice of techniques, remember, it's a menu, not a rule book, third, most people will use our notes as a personal one couple notebook from which they might get ideas, in this respect we have tried to stay wide open, one of the original aims of this book was to cure a notion, born of non-discussion, that common sex needs are odd or weird. The whole joy of sex with love is that there are no rules, so long as you enjoy, and the choice is practically unlimited, we have, however, left out long discussion of very specialized sexual preferences, people who like these know already what they want to try, the final group of readers are the hardy experimentalists, bent on trying absolutely everything, they too will do best to read this exactly like a cookbook, except that sex is safer in this respect, between lovers, in that you can't get obese or atherosclerotic on it, or give yourself ulcers. The worst you can get, given sensible safety precautions, is sore, anxious, or disappointed, however, one needs a steady basic diet of quiet, loving, night and morning intercourse to stand this experimentation on, simply because, contrary to popular ideas, the more regular sex a couple has, the higher the deliberately contrived peaks, just as the more you cook routinely, the better and the more reliable banquets you can stage. One specific group of readers deserves special note, if you are disabled in any way, don't stop reading, a physical disability is not an obstacle to fulfilling sex. In counseling disabled people, one repeatedly finds that the real disability isn't a mechanical problem but a mistaken idea that there is only one right, or enjoyable, way to have sex, the best approach is probably to go through the book with your partner, marking off the things you can do, then pick something appealing that you think you can't quite do, and see if there is a strategy you can develop together, talking to other couples where one partner has a problem similar to yours is another resource, in sum, the people we are addressing are the adventurous and uninhibited lovers who want to find the limits of their ability to enjoy sex, that means we take some things for granted. Having intercourse naked and spending time over it, being able and willing to make it last, up to a whole afternoon on occasion, having privacy, not being scared of things like genital kisses, not being obsessed with one sexual trick to the exclusion of all others, 
and, of course, loving each other. As the title implies, this book is about love as well as sex. You don't get high quality sex on any other basis. Either you love each other before you come to want it, or, if you happen to get it, you love each other because of it, or both. Just as you can't cook without heat, you can't make love without feedback. By feedback, we mean the right mixture of stop and go, tough and tender, exertion and affection. This comes by empathy and long mutual knowledge. Anyone who expects to get this in a first attempt with a stranger is an optimist, or a neurotic. If they do, it's what used to be called love at first sight, and isn't expendable. Skill, or variety, is no substitute. Also, one can't teach tenderness. The starting point of all lovemaking is close bodily contact. Love has been defined as the harmony of two souls, and the contact of two epidems. At the same time, we might as well plan our menu so that we learn to use the rest of our equipment. That includes our feelings of identity, forcefulness, and so on, and all of our fantasy needs. Luckily, sex behavior in humans is enormously elastic. It has had to be, or we wouldn't be here, and also nicely geared to help us express most of the needs that society or our upbringing have corked up. Elaboration in sex is something we need rather specially and it has the advantage that if we really make it work, it makes us more, not less receptive to each other as people. This is the answer to anyone who thinks that conscious effort to increase our sex range is mechanical or a substitute for real human relationship. We may start that way, but it's an excellent entry to learning that we are people and relating to each other as such. There may be other places we can learn to express all of ourselves, and do it mutually, but there aren't many. Those are the assumptions on which this book is based. Granted this, there are two modes of sex, the duet and the solo, and a good concert alternates between the two. The duet is a cooperative effort aiming at simultaneous orgasm, or at least one orgasm each, and complete, untechnically planned release. This, in fact, needs skill, and can be built up from more calculated love play until doing the right thing for both of you becomes fully automatic. This is the basic, sexual meal. The solo, by contrast, is when one partner is the player and the other the instrument. The aim of the player is to produce results on the other's pleasure experience as extensive, unexpected, and generally wild as his or her skill allows, to blow them out of themselves. The player doesn't lose control, though he or she can get wildly excited by what is happening to the other. The instrument does lose control, in fact, with a responsive instrument and a skillful performer. This is the concerto situation, and if it ends in an uncontrollable ensemble, so much the better. All the elements of music and dance are involved. Rhythm, mounting tension, tantalization, even forcefulness. I'm like the executioner, said the lady in the Persian poem. But where he inflicts intolerable pain I will only make you die of pleasure. There is indeed an element of infliction in the solo mode, which is why some lovers dislike it and others overdo it. But no major lovemaking is complete without some solo passages. The antique idea of the woman as passive and the man as performer used to ensure that he would show off playing solos on her, and early marriage manuals perpetuated this idea. Today, she is herself the soloist par excellence, whether in getting him excited to start with, or in controlling him and showing off all her skills, solo recitals are not, of course, necessarily separate from intercourse, apart from leading into it. There are many coital solos, for the woman astride, for example, while mutual masturbation or genital kisses can be fully-fledged duets, solo response can be electrifyingly extreme in the quietest people, skillfully handled by someone who doesn't stop for yells of murder but does know when to stop. A woman can get orgasm after orgasm, and a man can be kept hanging just short of climax to the limit of human endurance. The solo given orgasm, whether from her or from him, is unique, neither bigger nor smaller in either sex than a full duet but different, sharper but not so round, and most people who have experienced both like to alternate them. Trying to say how they differ is a little like describing wine, differ they do, however, and much depends on cultivating and alternating them. Top level enjoyment doesn't have to be varied, it just often is. In fact, 
Being stuck rigidly with one sex technique usually means anxiety. In this book we have, not, for example, focused on coital postures to the exclusion of all else. The common positions are now familiar to most people from writing and pictures if not from trial. The more extreme ones, as a rule, should be spontaneous. But few of them have marked advantages. This explains the apparent emphasis in this book on extras, the sauces and pickles. That said, individuals who, through a knot in their psyche, are obliged to live on sauce and pick alone are unfortunate in missing the most sustaining part of the meal. Exclusive obsessions in sex are very like living exclusively on horseradish sauce through allergy to beef. Fear of horseradish sauce, however, as indigestible, unnecessary, and immature is another hang-up, namely puritanism. One of the things still missing from the essence of sexual freedom is the unashamed ability to use sex as play. In the past, ideas of maturity were nearly as much to blame as old-style moralisms about what is normal or perverse. We are all immature, and have anxieties and aggressions. Coital play, like dreaming, may be a programmed way of dealing acceptably with these just as children express their fears and aggressions in games. Adults are unfortunately afraid of playing games, dressing up, and acting scenes. It makes them self-conscious, something horrid might get out. In this regard, bed is the place to play all the games you have ever wanted to play. If adults could become less self-conscious about such immature needs, we should have fewer deeply anxious people. If we were able to transmit the sense of play that is essential to a full, enterprising, and healthily immature view of sex between committed people, we would be performing a mitzvah. Playfulness is a part of love that could be a major contribution to human happiness. But still the main dish is loving, unselfconscious sexual pleasure of all kinds. Long, frequent, varied, ending with both parties satisfied but not so full they can't face another light course, and another meal in a few hours. The peace star resistance is good old face to face matrimonial, the finishing off position, with mutual orgasm, and starting with a full day or night of ordinary tenderness. Other ways of making love are special in various ways, and the changes of timbre are infinitely varied, complicated ones are for special occasions, or special uses like holding off an overquick male orgasm or are things that, like pepper steak, are stunning once a year but not staples. There are, after all, only two rules in good sex, apart from the obvious one of not doing things that are silly, antisocial, or dangerous. One is, don't do anything you don't really enjoy, and the other is, find out your partner's needs and don't balk at them if you can help it. In other words, a good giving and taking relationship depends on a compromise. So does going to a show. If you both want the same thing, fine. If not, take turns and don't let one partner always dictate. This can be easier than it sounds, because unless their partner wants something they find actively off-putting, real lovers get a reward not only from their own satisfaction but also from seeing the other respond and become satisfied. Most wives who don't like Chinese food will eat it occasionally for the pleasure of seeing a cinephile husband enjoy it and vice versa. Partners who won't do this over specific sex needs are usually balking not because they have tried it and it's a turn off. Many experimental dishes are nicer than you expected, but through ignorance of the range of human needs, plus being scared if these include things like forcefulness, cultivating extra genital sensation, or role playing which previous social mythology pretended weren't there. Reading a full list of the unscheduled accessory sex behaviors that some normal people find helpful might be thought a necessary preliminary to any extended sexual relationship. Couples should match up their needs and preferences, though people don't find these out at once. You won't get to some of our suggestions or understand them until you have learned to respond. It's a mistake to run so long as walking is such an enchanting and new experience and you may be happy pedestrians who match automatically. Where a rethink really helps is at the point where you have gotten used to each other socially. Sex needs aren't the only ones that need matching up between people who live together, and feel that the surface needs replishing. If you think that sexual relations are overrated, the surface does need replishing, 
and you haven't paid enough attention to the wider use of your sexual equipment as a way of communicating totally. The traditional expedient at the point where the surface gets dull is to trade in the relationship and start all over in an equally uninstructed attempt with someone else, on the off chance of getting a better match up by random choice. This is emotionally wasteful, and you usually repeat the same mistakes. Better by far to replish. As to practicalities, we suggest couples either read the book together or, perhaps even better, read it separately, marking passages for the other partner's attention. This works wonders if, as is often the case, you don't really talk easily about sexual needs, or are afraid of sounding tactless. Finally, if you don't like the repertoire or if it doesn't square with yours, never mind. The aim of the joy of sex is to stimulate your creative imagination. Sex books can only suggest techniques in order to encourage you to experiment. You can preface your own ideas with this is how we play it, and play it your own way. But by that time, when you will have tried all your own creative sexual fantasies, you won't need books. Ingredients Tenderness Tenderness a constant awareness of what your partner is feeling, plus the knowledge of how to heighten that feeling, gently, toughly, slowly, or fast. This, in fact, is what the whole book is about. It doesn't exclude extremely forceful games, though many people neither need nor want these, but it does exclude clumsiness, heavy-handedness, lack of feedback, spitefulness, and non rapport generally. Tenderness is shown fully in the way you touch each other. What it implies at root is a constant awareness of what your partner is feeling, plus the knowledge of how to heighten that feeling, gently, toughly, slowly, or fast, and this can only come from an inner state of mind between the two of you. No really tender person can simply turn over and go to sleep afterwards. Many if not most inexperienced men, and some women, are just naturally clumsy, either through haste anxiety, or lack of sensing how the other sex feels. So don't grab breasts, stick fingers into the vagina, bend the penis, or, and this goes for both sexes, misplace bony parts of your anatomy. More women respond to very light than to very heavy stimulation. Just brushing pubic or skin hairs will usually do far more than a whole hand grab. At the same time, don't be frightened, neither of you is made of glass. Women, by contrast, often fail to use enough pressure, especially in hand work, though the light, light variety is a sensation on its own. Start very gently, making full use of the skin surface, and work up. Stimulus toleration in any case increases with sexual excitement and even hard blows can become excitants, though not for everyone. This loss of pain sense disappears almost instantly with orgasm, so don't go on too long and be extra gentle as soon as he or she has come. If we could teach tenderness, most of this book would be superseded. If you are really heavy-handed, a little practice with inanimate surfaces, dress fastenings, and so on will help. Strength is a turn on in sex, but it isn't expressed in clumsy handwork, bear hugs, and brute force, at least not as starters. If there is a problem here, remember you both can talk. Few people want to be in bed on any terms with a person who isn't basically tender, and most people are delighted to be in bed with the right person who is. The ultimate test is whether you can bear to find the person there when you wake up. If you are actually pleased, then you can be sure that you are onto the right thing. Nakedness. Nakedness. The normal state for lovers who take their work at all seriously. The normal state for lovers who take their work at all seriously at least as a basic requisite. They don't so much start clothed, and shed what they must, as start naked, and add any extras they need. Nakedness doesn't mean lack of ornament. A woman may take off all her clothes, but put on all her jewels. The only practical need, as with wristwatches, is to see they don't catch or scratch. This is for daylight. It is difficult to sleep in them, for night. An increase in the value put on lovemaking is probably the main reason that many people now sleep naked. The only exception may be after. Warm bodies tend to stick, and a blotter worn by one or other can add to comfort. Nudists used to be associated with health fanatics enjoying a strict regime of cold showers and vigorous sports. Now, thank goodness, a more relaxed attitude prevails. 
today. Nudity is natural, not a ritual. Organized nudism in most countries is a family affair. This is probably a good idea. The nudity of one's own parents can be worrying to some children, and shouldn't be overdone. There is, however, a lot to be said for the opportunity to look at men and women in general under unforced conditions. It is the discharge of residual anxiety of this sort about our body acceptability that probably makes group nudity so relaxing, rather than the opportunity to get an all-over tan. There is also evidence that children brought up in a naturist environment may be more responsible when faced with sexual opportunities and asked to make sexual choices. You should be able to pick a naturist club to taste. They offer facilities for open-air nakedness, which are hard to organize at home and are universally tough on sexual advances, which makes for an almost uniquely relaxed atmosphere. Women, by her for him, women, like men, have direct physical responses, sure, science proves that we get turned on just as much as you and as quickly, it's simply that traditionally we have been discouraged. But our triggers are different. Breasts and skin first, please, not a direct grab at the clitoris and can't be short-circuited. It matters to us who is doing what, far more than it does to most men. The fact that, unlike you, we can't be visibly turned off and lose erection often confuses men into hurrying things or missing major resources. It isn't true that nudity, erotica, and so on don't excite us. Probably the difference is that they aren't overriding things and that we don't separate them from emotions as easily as you do. Is it fair, I wonder? To give a simple instance, you, sir, can make orgiastically satisfactory love with a near stranger in half an hour flat, but please don't think for that reason that you can do the same for a woman who loves you personally if, at the end of the half hour, you turn over and go straight to sleep, granted this however, there are common reactions, granted this difference, however, there are common reactions, we seem to be less heavily programmed than you for specific turn-ons. But once we see one of these working on a man we care about, we soon program it into our own response, and can be less rigid and more experimental because of this ability. Often, if we seem underactive, it's because we are wary of doing the wrong thing with that particular man, like touching up his penis when, in fact, he is trying not to ejaculate. Tell us if you see us at a loss. The penis isn't a weapon, for us so much as a shared possession, it's less the size than its personality, unpredictable movements, and moods that make up the turn on. We like penetration because it makes us feel close to you, but don't feel put down if we don't then necessarily climax through it alone, see her orgasm, work with that rather than being discouraged by it. Another important thing is the tough tender mixture, obviously strength is a turn on, but clumsiness, elbows in eyes, twisted fingers, for instance is the dead opposite, you never get anywhere by clumsy brutality. However brutal good lovemaking sometimes looks, the turn on is strength skill control, not large bruises, and the ability to be tender with it. Some people ask tough or tender? But the mood shifts so fast that you have got to be able to sense it. Surely it's possible, because some lovers do it, to read this balance from the feel of the woman, no obsessive views about reciprocity who comes on top and so on evens out during the passing of time, there can be long spells when we are happy to let you do the work, and others when we need to control everything ourselves and get an extra kick from seeing how we make you respond, women aren't submissive any more than men, if we have knuckled under in the past, it's only through social pressures, if we're dominant, we don't always act it out in bed by wearing spurs and cracking a whip. Men have a real advantage here in the constructive use of play, and can help women to act it out too. Since we all have some aggressions, good sex can be wildly forceful, but still never cruel. As for sexual equality, nobody can possibly be a good lover without regarding their partner as a person and an equal. That is really all there is to be said on the matter. Our sense of smell is the keener, don't oversaturate early on with masculine odors. Just before orgasm is probably the time for full odor contact. Our own smell excites us as well as yours. We learn, over a period of time, that the sort of hand and mouth work that men like varies enormously. Some like it very rough, some hate it anything but extremely gentle. 
others in between. There is no way for us to tell except by asking and being told, therefore it's up to you to say what you like or you may get the opposite. Remember that we love to know how to be good for you. Some men are extraordinarily passive, or unimaginative, or inhibited, and dash, oddly, when they are any of these things, we don't become correspondingly forceful. We may long to do things and feel thoroughly frustrated, but we won't show it in most cases, so a woman's lovemaking will only be as good as her partner's and, more important, she will resent any man who is unexciting, not only because he is unexciting, but also because she will know she has been unexciting too. Finally, you should never presume that what excites one woman sexually will work just as well on another woman. Women probably do differ sexually rather more than men, because of the greater complexity of our sexual apparatus, breasts, skin, and so on, as well as pussy. Never assume that you don't need to relearn for each person. This is also true for a woman with a new man, but perhaps a little less so. Men, buy him for her. Men, buy him for her. The most valued thing in lovemaking is the divine gift of lechery. We often wish that women's sexuality was like ours, even though we know it isn't. Our sexual response is far brisker and more automatic, it's triggered easily by things like putting a coin in a vending machine. Consequently, women and parts of women provide automatic sexual stimulus for us. Your clothes, breasts, odor, and so on aren't what we love instead of you, simply the things we need in order to set sex in motion and express love. You seem to find this hard to understand. Secondly, most though not all male feeling is ultimately centered in the last inch of the penis, though you can, if you start intelligently teach us female type sensitivity all over the surface of our skin, and unlike yours, our sexuality depends on a positive performance, we have to be turned on to achieve an erection, and not turned off, in order to function, we can't be passively taken. This matters intensely to men at both a biological and a personal level, sexual success is what makes us feel worthwhile, it explains why we are emphatically penis centered and tend to open the proceedings with genital play, probably before you are ready and when you would much rather wait to get in the mood, genital approach is how we get into the mood, you need to understand these reactions, as we need to understand yours, a woman's concern about being a sex object misses the point, sure, the woman and the various parts of her are sex objects, but most men ideally would wish to be treated piecemeal in the same way. Thus, the most valued thing, from you, in actual lovemaking, is intuition of these object reactions, and direct initiative, starting the play, taking hold of the penis, giving genital kisses ahead of being asked, being an initiator, a user of your stimulatory equipment. This is hard to put in simple terms, it is what is meant by the divine gift of lechery the art of sensing turn-ons and going along with them for the partner's response. It isn't the same for the two sexes because male turn-ons are concrete, while many female turn-ons are situational and atmospheric. Remember too that we may simply be tired of having to deliver, in life as well as in bed, and your taking over doesn't just offer us the ultimate compliment, it also gives us the opportunity to relax and enjoy. Sex may be about the only place in our lives where we get to be held and nurtured. Personal folklore apart, what the male turn on equipment requires is the exact reverse of a virgin or a passively recipient instrument, not a demand situation, because that in itself can threaten a turn off due to feelings of inadequacy, but a skill situation. I can turn you on, and turn myself on in doing so, and from that point we play it both ways and together, you can't, of course control your turn-ons any more than we can, but it helps if you have some male type object reactions, like being excited by the sight of a penis, or hairy skin, or by the man stripping, or by physical kinds of play, just as it helps if we have some sense of atmosphere. It's the active woman who understands our reactions, plays on them, and leads them out while keeping her own who is the ideal lover, hormones, the fuel in the sex machine, keeping desire, arousal and performance ticking over, as well as driving affection and love, for the most part, they form a constant underpinning of mood, supporting though never replacing the honest to goodness sexual diesel generated by enthusiastic lovers. A peak or a valley, on the other hand, can impact, 
Sexually, the crucial fuel is testosterone, for her as well as for him. His will peak during his twenties, then settle into a more or less consistent pattern, dipping over the course of a long-term relationship and rising in a new one. No excuse for straying, but a possible explanation of the temptation to do so. With age, it will gently decline, but rarely enough to cause problems. If his erection is failing, that's reason for action, not resignation. In her, testosterone has the same effect, raising desire, demand, and energy. In the last third of her menstrual month, 